So, hello everybody. Uh, thanks for attending this uh, this talk. So, sorry for being a bit late. Uh, technical issues. So, uh, who are we? We are Evolving Web. Uh, we are based in Montreal. Uh, we are a small company, about 10 persons. Uh, we are experts in Drupal. We don't do anything else. Uh, we are really focused on Drupal. And we have kind of some prestigious clients, including the Princeton University Press. Uh, so we had a, a case study this morning. I don't know if uh, anybody of you attended it. Uh, but also including the government of Canada uh, and the McGill University. Uh, so I invite you to go to our website. We are doing Drupal developments and also Drupal trainings. Uh, Suzanne is right here. She's the one that, uh, that is very famous in the Drupal training world. So uh, who am I? I'm Etienne Angasser, so I'm French. Uh, you'll notice by my accent. Um, I apologize right now if you don't understand some of the part I'm going to say. Uh, maybe my accent is, is too complex or <laughs> not good enough. Don't hesitate to, to ask me to repeat if you don't uh, get any, any of my sentence. Uh, I have a developer background. I, in fact, I started to, to study development, web development, and then I switched to project management because I thought it was more interesting for me and I saw, and I saw more perspective in this. So now, uh, I'm in Evolving Web since uh, August, so it's going to be basically a year this, uh, this year. And, uh, and that's it, so. Yeah, so I am not Etienne Angasser. I am Jigar Mehta. I'm from India, like, uh, and I've been uh, developing with PHP for like nine years now, maybe. And uh, I know HTML. And uh, I also do front-end, I also do back-end. Then uh, I started with Drupal in, back in 2013. And uh, I am like a language enthusiast, so I speak six languages and I am learning Mandarin and Italian. So uh, Alex asked me to mention that. Alex would be my boss. So <laughs> I'm mentioning that. And uh, I can solve the Rubik's Cube. Okay, so uh, let's move on. Okay, so why are we here? Um, we are here to discuss about general bad communications uh, which happen in the Drupal project, or in any project, in fact. Um, and we want our project to be smooth, but in fact, most of the time, they start to be to being chaotic. So, how to make them smooth? Uh, well, we are going to see through this talk uh, with different parts how to identify your different parties uh, uh, that are going to be involved in the project. Uh, we're going to focus on three parties exactly. Uh, we are going to speak about the importance of communication, how to improve it. We're going to discuss about how to use this communication during a scoping phase, an estimation phase, and the execution of the project. So let's start by identifying the parties that are involved. So the first parties you are going to have to, to talk to is the client. Most of the time, the client isn't really a technical person, uh, so you have to to, to identify which kind of clients you're having referred to. Sometimes you're gonna have really technical clients with specific needs who are going to have a lot of knowledge, so you don't, you don't have to really be, uh, to simplify Drupal terms and technologic terms. You can speak to them directly, but, but most of the clients, they are not so technical, so you have to simplify the communication with them. One thing that is important with a client is to set expectations. So never, never, never try to, to do a false promise or to say yes to something you're not sure about to a client. So this is something that, that, that's really important. If a client comes to you and asks you, I want this website within the next week, and it's not doable, you're just gonna say, hey, no. You need to set expectations. And it's going to be the same along all the process and all the talk we are going to have. So be sure this is the first thing you have to do with a client. Set the expectations. Uh, most of the expectations are going to be about budget and timeline with the client, but it can be also about resources uh, and specific points. Most of the time, don't keep your client in the dark. You don't want to do this. You want, to, you want him to be confident, to have trust in you. So make sure he, he knows what you're doing, when you're doing it, and when he's going to have something to see and to be delivered. The second party you're going to talk to are your developers. This is your team. So they are on your side, but they can be kind of different than you. When I say you, I include me as a project manager. Developers are, are like, like the clients. There are different kind of developers. There are developers that you can just say, hey, I want to build an e-commerce website. And it's going to come with a, li a list of requirements like, hey, I have this idea, I have this idea. 
and you have developers that are going to ask for more details. Hey, okay, do you want an e-commerce website? Uh, what kind of, of website do you want? Do you, do, are we speaking Amazon? Are we speaking about a simple bookstore? Are we speaking something in between? You're gonna have to guide them and provide them detail. Uh, they are very passionate and they love that, what they do. So make sure that you feel confident in them and you're giving them projects or sell them the project to, to give them to understand the purpose of it. Uh, if you're asking your developers to build something they don't like all the time, you're gonna lose your team basically. You need to have them involved and believe in you. So one thing that is very important with your developers uh, along the, all your projects are to trust them because they are going to be the one with the knowledge. Uh, you as project manager, you cannot, you cannot reply to any answers. Uh, it happened to me like an hour ago, a person came to me asking me questions about translations in Drupal. I'm like, yeah, I can a bit help you, but I'm not, a, I'm not a developer, I'm only a project manager. And it's going to be this all the way from the scoping to the execution to the estimation. You're gonna have to require this technical knowledge to estimate and to see how complex a project can be. So you need to trust them and to involve them into the entire process. Even if developers don't really like to communicate and to manage communications with the client, you need to be the bridge between the client and the developer because it's really important for them to feel involved and not just the guy who is going to build without any, any, any recognition from, from, your side, from, from your side. You need to, to make them feel like that you love them and they are going to be, to be proud of what they build. So the last part is you, the project manager. So basically, you're going to be like a communicator along the project. You're gonna translate needs, you're gonna set expectations, you're gonna ensure everything is, is going well. You're gonna plan, you're gonna, you're gonna take decisions, you're gonna require decisions from the client, you're gonna ensure everything is ready for your team. So one thing that is important when you're a project manager is to, um, is to make sure that all the, the parts you're going to, to discuss with are well defined since day zero in the project. If you will need to involve a designer, a content specialist, or a SEO specialist, make sure you're identifying all the parties. I didn't like involve all the parties uh, in a Drupal project in these slides because it could take hours. You know, I could have gone to the security expert, uh, the, the other project manager on the client side. Sometimes you are, you're having big clients which have one, two, three, three project uh, manager, a decision maker, two decision makers. So you have a like kind of a hierarchy to respect. So make sure you have all the informations uh, uh, on your side before before starting a Drupal project and any project uh, in real life because you need to ensure that you know everything about the project requirements, needs, and targets. So I'm gonna let Jigal discuss about the importance of communication. Okay, so... Uh, uh, yeah, so has anybody heard the story about the Babel Tower? Yeah? So it's like a man was trying to build a tower to reach heaven, and then God got angry, and he said, okay, so I'll curse you with miscommunication and he made them all speak different languages and uh, so they couldn't coordinate and the project was like project didn't go as planned so uh, so the thing is we don't want to be want our project to be like this Babel Tower thing and uh, we leave no room for guessing we make sure that everything is clearly defined that like we are not like walking in the darkness and towards the wall so uh, that would be the first thing. Then uh, avoid, yeah, that will save you a bunch of efforts, like the slide says. Avoid having to rewrite code or redo a feature. You make something and the client said, oh, this is completely the opposite of what I wanted. I want something else. So you will save times, uh, a time uh, like this, and then uh, prevent delays and loss of money. So uh, time is money. You must have heard that a million times. So if you save developer time, you spend the time in the doing the right thing. So uh, then, uh, yeah, the last point is, like a satisfied client is the best form of publicity. So you do some real good job and the client meets their like, people and says, I got my website from this particular company and they did a really good job. So maybe you can hire them for like, getting a, like, a renovation for your site. And uh, uh, like uh, Etienne wanted to add the stress on that particular section on the right. 
Like, uh, if there is a problem in communication and uh, something doesn't go as planned, like if your developer says, oh, I didn't even know that I was supposed to build something like that, uh, then uh, you cannot like go around playing the blame game. You have to take the blame yourself because you were the one in charge of uh, being like the interpreter between the client and the developers. So it is your responsibility to like assume the responsibility that I will make sure what the client says is conveyed correctly to the developer team and what the developers are asking for will be asked for from the clients and then they get their answers. So if the, there is miscommunication, the fault is nobody's but yours. And uh, yeah, when in Rome, speak as Romans do. So it, uh, what we mean is like a, when you're talking to the developers, usually developers tend to be detail-oriented. So talk to them in a nice way, like uh, I want this and this and this specifically. I want a red-colored tie with a white-colored shirt and things like that. And if you're talking to the client, you may, may, may want to like not go so much into technical details. You can say, I want a formal dress. Or maybe the client will say, I want some formal like get up and the dev team will ask, okay, so he, what does he mean by formal? So dev tends to be more detail oriented and clients are usually like vague and they, they say things without thinking. So the poutine example this is what I came up with. I moved to Montreal like in June 2017 and one of the things I wanted to try when I got there was poutine. So it's basically fried things like fried potatoes with some gravy and cheese curds. So I had watched many YouTube videos about this and I finally tried it. So the first error that I made, the first day I went to try poutine was after Drupal Camp Montreal. And uh, that day I said, like, I want to try poutine. And the lady said, okay, here you go. So I don't eat much like non-veg stuff. I try to avoid it. Uh, and that day I had the poutine, I said, this tastes good, and, but was it vegetarian? Well, my, like, the other project manager before Etienne said, are you sure it's vegetarian? And then I figured out there was some beef or something in the sauce. So I said, okay, I must have been a bad client. I didn't express my requirements correctly. So when you want a veg poutine, maybe you want to try to say, like, I want a veg poutine, because the other person might not know what you want. So uh, you need to like get the specifications really clear in black and white and have an agreement on exactly what you need, but not in a restaurant though. And uh, so, uh, yeah, and uh, one more thing is like client, like being very busy and into uh, like, it's not always expected of them to give you well-organized data. So they think this is, okay, I'll just type something and we'll send it. Not all clients are like this, but you can see that like on the left column, you have a bunch of text, which translates to those simplified points on the right. So instead of saying all these things in one like big sentence where people have to go in and like uh, fi figure out, okay, so he wants this. Oh, he mentioned that there. So instead of trying to play Sherlock Holmes and deducing points from a big paragraph, we can ask them to simplify things, or if they don't want to do it, then somebody has to take the responsibility of converting paragraphs into bullet points and so that everybody can take a quick look and understand things, and everybody is on the same page. So, uh, yeah, one more good thing to do is, uh, like, people tend to, there are, like, some companies which don't do this, like, have limit the points of contact. Uh, Back in India, I used to work for a company which used to do that, and I knew a lot of companies which used to do things like that. So what they would do is like uh, one day, maybe the project manager is very busy, so they would tell the developer, okay, so go answer this mail. And they would say something which they don't know, they have no idea what they're talking about, and the project manager will see the mail uh, because he'll be CC'd in there, and he will say, why did you say this? I told him, this was going to take two weeks, and now you're saying it's going to take one week. So it's better to have one point of contact, and the other advantage of this would be like people cannot play the blame game. So there's one person who knows everything about the project, so he cannot like say, oh, I didn't know about this. He was the one who talked to the client, so he knows this. But that day, it wasn't him, it was me. So you cannot do that. So there's one person who has all the knowledge, and uh, 
you want to like uh, imp to improve your communication you want to establish like a proper channel of communication so when it's uh, for example things like uh, requirements and feedback how do we manage that do we have some kind of a base camp kind of a thing where you can put to-do lists are we using an excel sheet where the client puts in all the points then maybe we write this is like green rows are done and yellow rows are in progress and things like that or maybe we want to do something like jira and redmine things like that so uh, that's one more thing you, you need to establish so that people are not having uh, undocumented verbal conversation uh, and everything is in written so that you can refer to it in the future. Uh, one more thing is documentation. So as, as the project gets bigger and complex, you want to like write everything down that we face this problem. We were installing Drupal 7 and this thing happened. So this guy said we want to upgrade to Drupal 7.5.6 and it will improve somehow. So all those kind of details, we might want to write them down so that if something breaks in the future, then uh, we would be in a better position to evaluate and our decisions, and we would know exactly why we took like the particular decisions we took. And uh, we also want to establish like a demo and approval procedure. Like when, when do we call the project done? Like is it someday when the client is really feeling happy and he sees a broken site and says, "Oh, it's done," so it's done. No, or we want to establish like more agile kind of a stuff like acceptance criteria for this feature. So if you can go to the subscription form, put your email and then put your name and you press the submit button. So you should see a message saying like you are subscribed. And so that's a better way to define things. And you have to reach like agree upon an acceptable level of detail when you're doing this. So you don't want to go into details like, oh, the sentence should end with a full stop not that kind of detail but an acceptable detail like you'll see a green message and the next time you send a mail they will everybody will subscribe will receive an email so that's one more point then uh, don't over communicate like i did with the previous point do not exaggerate a lot like do not, do not lay like too much emphasis on something or maybe elaborate and elaborate on something keep it precise concise so that everybody can understood and the main point is conveyed and that should be good enough and uh, like uh, has anybody heard about the concept of barriers of two of barriers of communication it's like a, a bunch of barriers that people agreed upon that people have while they're communicating trying to communicate they have a list like conceptual barriers perceptual barriers language barriers cultural barriers so we might want to like do something to get over those. Like uh, we know we are in the United States of America, so I won't present this thing in Spanish. So it would be overcoming the language barrier and things like that. So uh, and then you need to ask the right the right questions to ask. Yeah. So this would be like uh, how to approach. Understanding the problem would be like you can define it in a nice way by asking the questions like why, what, when, and things like that. So first the whys. Why, why do we need the website? Do we just do it for fun or do we just do it like to get a lot of people to visit our site and then we made, make ad revenue? Or do we want to show something to people? Are we trying to sell products? So once that is clear, you can like define, a, you can you have a better picture of what the client needs and what you're trying to build, and then you can define your goals. Like the home page needs to be accessible when you search this person's name or search for this product, and the product page must appear. So you have clear goals. Like SEO is really important, or is the look of the website really important? What what is it? So first question would be why do we build the website? And then would be when. When do you need the website? Do you need it like in a week? Then I'll use something like Squarespace or something. Or if you need it in two months, then depending on the requirements, maybe I'll use Drupal and so things like that. And the timeline and budget need to be taken into consideration while 
doing this. Like usually when the timeline reduces, you want the project quicker, the budget usually goes up because we need to employ more people at the same time. And uh, yeah, you need to confirm what's more flexible. Like you, you have to go for like budget gets priority over timeline or timeline gets more priority over budget. So if the client has a higher budget to have eight developers working parallelly on the project to get the project done in two months, then it's okay. Otherwise, if they want like have a limited budget, then we stress the timeline. Like we, we say, okay, so we have three developers working on our project. We'll take two to three months to do it. So that's one more question. And uh, most of the times, being the project manager, assuming most of you might be interested in project managing management. So uh, you, you are the person who has done this kind of thing. So if the client doesn't know what to do or doesn't know how to, which way to go, then maybe you can guide them. You can tell them, okay, so which, is, which one do you want? You have a flexible budget or a timeline? What do you need? You can help them answer these questions for, if they, uh, for them if they don't know the answers to them. And uh, who? So the next important question would be, what happened to the who? Okay. So... Uh, Per? That it's there if you need it. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, thank you. And uh, so the thing is, yeah, for the who's, it would be, who is the website for? Are we looking to, like, looking at a dev developer portal? Like, we, we are working on a developer portal for Western Digital. So, uh, like, for a dev developer portal like that one, things are really different. You don't need fancy banners and sliders and things like that. You just give them the API and you have a like, nice sticky menu they can click and jump to the relevant API. And if you're building it for the end user, then uh, there was uh, like a, a person, friend of mine in Colombia who told me, in Bogota, todo entra, entra por los ojos. That means everything enters through your eyes. So you have to have a fancy flashy banner and like buttons when you hover over them, they grow bigger and things like that to make it more attractive. So you need to decide uh, who you're building the site for. Then the next question would be, who in your team is going to like build the thing? So do you need two senior developers? Do you need one senior developer, one junior developer? Or you need to plan your team accordingly, according to the like specializations that they have. If they need an e-commerce site, then we choose the ones who have done such kind of thing and uh, things like that. Then. Uh, the other question would be, who is going to manage the content? Are, are they really good Drupal site builders that are going to do things? Or do we need to make things really easy for like a, a really new Drupal user to be able to do it? Uh, and things like that. So, and uh, one more thing would be, who is going to maintain it? It's similar to the previous point. So uh, make sure, yeah, please go away. Yeah. So, yeah, the, you need to make sure the target is clearly defined and the parties involved, the people you have chosen to do the thing. And how? How will the website work? So this is more like the first point. Like, what are the functionalities? How are we going to do that? If there's a subscription form, then is it completely going to be visible when you land on the page? Or they see only a email field and once they type their email, we show them the rest of the big form. So is it going to be like that? And uh, you have to clearly define the features once again. So uh, instead of writing, I need a contact form, the client, we need to build a contact form. We could like go more agile and be more detail oriented and write like as uh, anonymous, as an anonymous user, we want to be able to fill up a form and type a message and an email address, username, and things like that. And when we click the send button, then we see a green message saying that the message has been successfully sent. And the third person should receive an automatic response saying, uh, we'll get back to you in 24 hours. And uh, even though the client won't get back in 24 hours. And uh, what? So it's about. Uh, the content of the website, the thing, things that are going to appear on the website, is it going to be an image gallery? Is it going to be products? So you need to have that in mind. Like uh, one of my friends, 
I built a, built a website for him, he's a photographer. So he said, I want this blog page, and it's just like a friend of mine, so I didn't charge him anything. So I built him a really nice blog. And then one day he calls me and says like, I'm on the blog list page and it's completely broken. What have you done? So I said, I went to the page and I said, uh, the CSS was quite nice, quite nice, quite nice. So why is the page broken? Then I see he has no text in the blogs. He has like one image for the banner. Then in the body of the blog, he has a series of six images. So when you go to the blog list page, there's no text to be displayed next to the images like YouTube. You have the thumbnail on the left and text on the right. And instead of the text on the right, he has only images, so they are breaking the layout. So I said, okay, brother, if you want a website, you want a blog, you might want to write a paragraph at least, you know, instead <laughs> of like, I built you a gallery already, you can upload images there, but if you want a blog, then maybe write a paragraph. So he said, okay, I'll add some paragraphs. So you need to figure that out. And what is it going to be, what is it going to look like? What responsibility will be allocated to whom? We discussed that. And where? So this is also an important question. Uh, where is the site going to be hosted? Are we going to host it on Pantheon? I love Pantheon. And, uh, or is it going to be hosted on the client's FTP server where you have to right click, like select files, right click and upload? Or is it going to be something different? So you uh, want to make that clear so that you can plan things in advance? And uh, are there going to be permission is issues on the file system? So that's one more question as well. And uh, where is the content coming from? So if the client has an existing website, you might want to analyze it first and make sure like all the data they have has a like you have a clear path plan of how to get this thing here. So maybe they had a WordPress site in their old like WordPress blog in the old site. So you would say, okay, so I can create a blog in Drupal. Then if they had a bunch of static HTML pages, then okay, then I'll write a migration to pull this data into Drupal. So for everything that already exists or is required in the new site, you, you want to like write down points of as to how you're going to get that data into the new site. So that will give you a better picture of uh, all the tasks you'll have to take up. And uh, yeah, one more important question is, uh, where, where's the target audience going to be from and where's the client located so there are like cultural differences everywhere and uh, like uh, Chinese people usually don't have the fourth floor in their buildings but in Canada and America like there are many buildings without the 13th floor so there are cultural differences because the number four in Chinese sounds like the word for death so they usually avoid the fourth floor and they have 3A, 3B so things like that. So if, if you want, the like depending on the region where you want to show the site, you might want to choose the colors accordingly. And some sites even put like different images accordingly. Like if you're seeing in the US, you would see a different person. If you're seeing like making a website for, like a dating website for men, then you want to pay, put a picture of a beautiful lady in the homepage, things like that. And uh, yeah, and then, Scoping guidelines, this would be, oh, you have it here. So uh, analyze the existing website, website, like I said. Do not hesitate to clarify. So uh, if you have some questions, just don't hold them, like but keep them locked in your heart. Just let them come out, ask the people, like ask the client exactly what they want. Uh, like there are many people who are really scared. Oh, I'm asking too many questions. But it's really nice to ask those questions because you know the project better and you understand exactly what the client wants. And uh, involve your dev team uh, to ensure everything is doable. So instead of going to the client and agreeing to everything without knowing anything, and then coming back to your team and telling them, oh, I agreed to this, now you have to do it. Uh, you can like take a dev with you if required, and uh, then he can uh, contradict you or maybe he can give his uh, opinions when you're talking to the client. So if the client says, I want a spaceship, then the dev would say, spaceship is not doable in two months. We need more time. So that, that would be a good thing. And uh, never make false promises. So this is a really nice thing to do. Don't be like a liar. And uh, <laughs> like, has anybody seen the meme that says, 
false witness, false witness, thy trouser, trousers combust. It means liar, liar, <laughs> pants on fire. So don't do that and make false promises. Just be honest and go the right way. And know that no is also an answer. So don't be really scared. Like if I say no, they'll like go to some other vendor. Just if you can't do it, just tell them you can't do it. So everything else will, or maybe find, find some, suggest something else. But uh, don't agree to everything without thinking. And plan for the future. This is really important. Like if the client says, for right now, I have a budget of this much, I want a blog, but in the future, I might want to have a subscription system where people can subscribe. So if they, you know that, like that will help you plan for the future, and you will think of, okay, so you'll tell the developer, maybe keep some provision of adding something in the side of the page. So in the future, when they want the newsletter or the recent articles, uh, we will put some content in the right hand sidebar so you are more ready to face challenges like uh, this one uh, and uh, having asked the right questions it's time for my amigo here to discuss about estimation okay thank you um, so estimations are really important after sometimes they come before the scoping phase or before asking the questions you got just mentioned Sometimes it comes after. It depends on the kind of client you are having referred to and the kind of process your company is used to do. Most of the time, clients client are going to ask estimations. What is an estimation? Can you switch slides yeah, when I, I do? do. I <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, so what is an estimation? There is a dictionary definition that is saying that it's a tentative evaluation or a rough calculation. When a client asks you for an estimation, is not asking for an, a rough estimation or for some vague numbers. He's asking you, oh, so you think building Facebook is going to cost me $100 million? OK, and you come back to him maybe two weeks or three months later after having all those questions and this good scoping phase. Ah, sorry, it's going to cost you $3 billion. Oh, what? But you said $100 million. So be sure you're always on the same page as a, as a client when you're discussing numbers. This is really important. and. Basically, this is what they are going to pay you. So if they expect to have a website for 100K or 50K, make sure that when you're discussing evaluation or estimations, they know that it's a preliminary estimation or maybe a commitment. We're going to discuss after, um, about this after a bit later. A commitment is going to be the promise you're going to do to the, to the client. So never uh, misjudge between estimations and, uh, and commitments. So basically, um, you can you can manage your your estimations. Um, this part, by the way, is extracted from the book from uh, Steve McConnell and uh, another guy, Andy Urashki. If I'm not saying the wrong the the name is the wrong way, it's at the end of the uh, of the slides. You're gonna see it, but it's a uh, it's a great book, uh, Software Estimation by Steve McConnell. Uh, there is this quote saying, "Estimations on, on software projects interplay." with business targets, commitment, and control. So we're gonna discuss a bit about those, uh, those three points, targets, commitments, and control. So basically, the estimations are coming from your developers. You're gonna ask them, hey, how much time to build a, a blog section? He's gonna tell you, it's gonna cost me, maybe I'm gonna spend three hours to do it, a day, top. So you have an estimation from the client. The client is gonna give you, oh, I need my blog section within the next week. And you're gonna say, okay, this is a target I need to achieve. And I need to cost maybe less than $300. Okay, this is gonna be difficult. You don't have much budget. Or maybe they are going to give you, oh, we only have 100K for this website. And you're gonna say, okay, you want Facebook under 100K? Mm, uh, we'll see what we can do. Never misjudge the target and what you can really achieve. Uh, the commitment you are going to give to the client is really a, prom a promise. So never, never say, okay, we can do this, we can reach your target. Discuss with the client, because maybe the client is gonna to say to you, yeah, I want to build Facebook, but I want to build it step by, step by step, and I have 100K to start. You're gonna say, okay, let's see. Let's see what kind of features we can include in this first phase. Or let's see if we can discover some, some minor, minor requirements, minor features. Can we, can we make the timeline a bit longer? Or do we have, do we have this seven to present? Do we have to, to present something for, for this Drupal account? Or is that okay if we don't have it? Define what is really non-flexible and what is flexible. Always try to, to understand the client and not to say, okay, this target is irrealistic, or 
the target is what it is. I have 50k for this uh, for this website. I can have more. I can have less. You, you never know. So discuss with the client. Don't don't take this target as the estimation because sometimes the client is going to come to you. We have a 100k budget, and most of the agencies with, with who you are going to compete are going to deliver 100k estimates. But you don't know what they are going to agree with the client later on. So make sure that you understand the target, what's flexible, what's not. Uh, and this is a good quote by Philip Armour. Uh, it's called an estimation, not an exactimation. Okay? Never misunderstand, uh, misunderstand that. And make sure with the client that your estimation can be different from the commitment you're going to deliver. So uh, to reach the target the client wants, you're going to play with uh, with the project control. Those are elements you can actually control. We are not speaking about budget or timeline, but we, we are talking about the staff. Uh, maybe you will know that the staff is, the staff is not ready when, uh, when the client wants it, so you want to play with it. Okay, I need more staff now. I need to hire two, three, four, five freelancers to, to reach a target. Uh, oh, this freelancer is less, less experienced, like Jigar mentioned. Know what, what kind of project you're going to jump into, because you might want more technical developer or more advanced developer or more senior developers in a, in a project. Also, see which kind of requirements you can remove, add, and which one might be redefined along the project. This happens all the time. I mean, every day you're having a client, oh, by the way, can we add a video in the banner of the blog? Okay, we didn't develop it, now we have to do it. Make sure you're considering all these points in your estimations because you need to add padding all the time. This is the, the key to estimations, having padding. So, uh, what's a good estimate? Uh, in the book, uh, Software Estimation uh, from Steve McConnell, there is a, a, a good study. Um, people are always defining a good estimate um, that, that you're going to be 90% confident about the range you're going to provide is going to be correct. So, if I'm telling you in this room now, I can estimate that there is between 0 and 100%. I'm 90% sure that I'm going to be correct. So uh, Steve McConnell created a, a quick study with random questions, like you can see on the, on the side. What is the surface temperature of the sun? Uh, what is the total volume of water of the Great Lakes? And random qu questions like this. And he asked to a panel of, of 600 person to reply to those questions, being 90% confident that the range are going to provide is going to be correct. So. If you're following this logic, you should be at least nine uh, correct answers out of 10 questions, right? So when we study the results, in fact, we, we can see here in the, in the small graphic that nobody scored a perfect, a perfect 10, and a few person have a eight or plus correct answers. So basically, most of the answers, are, um, uh, most of the person are providing between one and three correct answers. So keep in mind that when you're providing, when anybody provides you an estimate, it can be your developer, it can be even you like, oh, I don't need to ask my developer for this feature, I pretty know what is it. Even if you feel 90% confident, sometimes you're mistaken and you're maybe 30% confident or maybe even less. So keep that in mind when you're doing an estimate, it's really important to, to have this, this padding and, uh, and keep, uh, keep this kind of, of idea in mind. So, we are speaking of padding. Should we overestimate or underestimate? Let's directly um, see the cons between overestimation and underestimation. The overestimation is just going to be you're going to ask to the client more time or more budget to do something. Uh, if it's more budget, maybe you will lose it because it's really out of budget for the client. And if you are going to have more time, well, let's say tomorrow I ask Jigar to build an e-commerce website. He's going to tell me, yeah, it's going to take me maybe two weeks to, to set up the car process. And maybe he's overestimating. And he's gonna spend one week doing it, and the rest of the week he's gonna other, either work on other stuff or procrastinate and being very slow. So you're gonna have a mismanagement on this side and you don't really want to overestimate your project. On the other side, the underestimation is a pretty big deal. You, don't, you really don't want to underestimate a project. Uh, you're gonna end up with planning errors and delays. This is terrible and this is happening in most of the projects you're facing today. You tend to be, uh, once again, as, as, uh, as kind uh, as you can with the client, trying to achieve the target they are fixing. Like, okay, they need a website by May, let's, let's try to fit everything in there. And you're underestimating the effort you have to input in the project and you end up with delays, apologize and everything. 
also know that your developers usually underestimate their effort. So they don't think about iterations. Uh, are the clients uh, going to ask for minor modification, major, like, oh, please add this binary image as I asked you in the blog. You need to keep in mind that when a developer is telling you that, it's, that, it, that something is going to take four hours, it might take six, seven, ten maybe, uh, depending on the feature you're facing. Uh, so never underestimate something a developer is already underestimating because you're, you're going to end up by giving free time all the time to your client. Um, and you're going to end up also with not enough time for essential tasks. So here I'm speaking about the scoping phase, the requirements, the design. Designs are really important in a project. Sometimes they are, they are just showing, oh, but you want a date here? You never, you, you never mentioned you wanted a date uh, in, in your books. I'm like, okay, you need to define everything and you, you need to take time to do this. This takes time. So never, never underestimate your, your project, but also don't overestimate too much. This doesn't make sense to, to overestimate. And yeah, there is a study showing that if you give the client the option of a short planning with a high variability risk, or, or larger planning, or a larger schedule with a lower variability risk, 80% of the person are going to take the safe choice. This is what the client wants. And once again, you are the expert. So if the planning they, are, they want to apply to the project is unrealistic, you have to say no and to guide them. You are the expert here. So having a late project, you're, you might all know this, we do. Uh, it happens sometimes, unfortunately. You end up with bugs in the system. So later on, you're going to have to catch up and to fix this. You're going to have to apologize to the client, which you don't want to, because on, on, uh, on, the, on the end, like, uh, like Jigar mentioned, it's not, it's not the client's fault if you want a website in, in one month. It's not the developer's fault. It's yours, because you, ha you had to say no in the first time. You had to say uh, to the developers how was the blog supposed to be. You have to set expectations. So you have to apologize if, uh, if you're late and the client won't like it. Uh, you're going to have to, to delay the project. And so other, uh, the planning on other projects you're going to have are going also to be delayed. So you don't want that. Uh, so a good estimate, this is a pretty good definition, is, a, is an estimate that is going to, be, to give to the decision maker a clear view of what the project is going to look, look like and how you can control it. So always keep in mind that you have tools to control the, to control the project, the staff, the requirements you can remove or add, um, and the timeline, if you can play with it, don't hesitate. Make sure you're having always a timeline in mind when you're doing this. So. I'm going to speak to you about the corner of uncertainty. This is a pretty, pretty good example to see how accurate an estimate can be along the project uh, between the different uh, steps of the project. So first of all, the client is going to come, hey, I want a website. OK, this is going to cost you between 10K and $1 million because you don't know pretty anything about the website. And along the steps, as you can see here in this graphic, you're going you're to reduce the, the padding in the estimations. And you want to try to have as, uh, an, uh, an estimation as accurate as possible. So sometimes a client is going to want an estimation and a commitment from the day zero. So this is pretty impossible to do. Try to, to cut the, to break the project into different phases. So if you, if you can manage to have a scoping phase first, this is the ideal for you because you're going to be able to define all the needs from the client, <coughs> all, uh, all the complexity of the project and all the features. So this is going to allow you to have a pretty, pretty accurate estimate. And if, if you can also uh, define um, a design phase and then provide a final estimation and a final commitment to the client for the total cost of the project, this is great. This is not always the case. I mean, clients want, OK, I want a website which is going to be an e-commerce website with a blog section and normal pages. How much uh, is it going to cost me? Ah, OK, you need to estimate. You're going to have a small talks. But you won't really have a scoping phase, a design phase, and everything. So you need to have a pretty good padding and a pretty good um, overview of all your projects. Uh, don't hesitate to use those all projects as like a, a knowledge base. Oh, OK, so we had this e-commerce website. It took us four months. Look, we had some problems there, there. OK, we can grossly estimate. But once again, never underestimate. Uh, there is, um, I was discussing with, uh, with someone in the audience uh, before the, the chat started about the, cur the winner's curse, which is if you, basically if you win uh, 
um, a project, uh, it's probably that's because you're under the client's uh, expectations. So let's say if today uh, I, would, uh, I would ask to anybody in the audience to give me uh, an estimation for my watch and like the highest bidder is going to win it, you might, the, the winner is going to probably overpay because it's going to match my expectations, okay? So be careful with, uh, with the estimations you're doing with the clients. Never, never, never underestimate. This is a key really to, to estimate a project. Uh, also, so quick tips to, to, to proceed to an estimation. You are often forgetting about common, common tasks. Uh, Stand-ups, status meetings, this takes time. time. And if you're having uh, yourself two developers in the room doing a status meeting, this is instead of one hour, you're going to end up spending three hours. Um, think about a, a contract review. I have Alex in the room here. We know something about it. Sometimes it's pretty long, huge contract, 50 pages. Uh, for me, it's French. It's in English. It takes more, even more time to understand everything. So make sure you're adding padding in there. Uh, you need to think about setup, build. If you have to onboard new developers, they're going to have to create the version of the website on their local machine. Everything takes time in the project. So once again, add padding. Uh, considering all those, uh, all those points, and also be very careful when you're delivering your planning. Think about the vacation, the, the employees that might be sick, and all the other events. Uh, we made this mistake, like, for this, not, it's not a huge mistake, no, don't look at me like that. <laughs> it's not a, a huge mistake, but uh, we are having a project currently, and today, uh, and yesterday I was not in the office to manage the project, so we have other developers in Montreal. If they need me, I'm not here. So you need to think about everything. This is very difficult. That's why estimating is quite a task because clients are having high expectations. They want it to be precise, to be quickly delivered. But think about all those points all the time. Uh, if you want to know more, you'll see the, um, the slide that, uh, with a link to, to see the, the other pre presentation um, that was uh, inspiring me for, for this one. And also the book. It's a really good book to read. So if you want to, to go ahead, uh, please do. So, Giga is going to talk to you about the execution of the project and the, and the launch. Okay, so uh, like the slice has already said, launch, oh, it's go. <laughs> so, uh, uh, we'll, we'll ha talk about some useful tips that you can follow to keep things on track. So, uh, it's a better thing to think agile, like there's a reason why many people are doing that. So, it helps you keep things organized and instead of, like, uh, say for example, uh, you, you're uh, starting with an e-commerce project and you just tell the client, okay, so the contract is signed, I'm starting the project, and when do I get to see the site? The client asks, and you say, well, when we are done. So, okay, so after two months, you go show it to the client and they say, this is exactly the opposite of what I wanted. So why didn't you show this to me like before? I, if I could have seen it first, I could have corrected you and sent you in the right direction. So it's good to have uh, practices like uh, regular demos and break things into like phases or sprints. So uh, every week you show some progress to the client or maybe every couple of weeks you show them what exactly you're working on. And uh, that way things stay on the track. And then it's a good thing to have regular meetings with your team and with the client so that uh, the client uh, knows exactly what you're working on if you have any questions, then you can ask them and get the required information to your dev team so that they can work on the, like, go on the right track. And you need to communicate with your team on a regular basis, like maybe have things like daily stand-up or at least once, uh, once a while talk to them, like in once in two days if that's not possible, every day, so that uh, you know exactly what somebody is working on and if somebody is doing the wrong thing, like not doing their thing correctly or doing something which is not a part of the project, like uh, then you can correct them. Like uh, a nice example would be they're trying to build a custom newsletter solution when they can integrate MailChimp. So that, that would be a good thing to do. Then uh, define responsibilities. So uh, everybody in your team knows exactly what they're supposed to work on, and the client exactly knows what they're supposed to come up with. So if next week is the launch, or maybe the launch is in three weeks, you tell the client, okay, so you are expecting the launch in three weeks, so it's your responsibility to come up with the content. If you don't, then it won't be our fault that your site doesn't go live. And um, 
uh, tell the dev as well about their responsibility so they know like exactly what they're supposed to work on uh, instead of trying to look for tasks like what can I help somebody with and um, uh, one more thing would be like raise flags about blockers as soon as possible so uh, like the continuing with the launch example we uh, I just gave like uh, if the site is supposed to go live soon you you and you don't have the content that means there's a big problem yeah like it will block everything no nothing will pro uh, make progress so you need to do things like that or say you're integrating a service into your uh, website like you need to get some address validation from FedEx and things like that and you've written some code but you don't have the API credentials to uh, configure so you need to flag that immediately like the site is going live soon or I'm supposed to finish this feature in two days I don't have the required required things like if I don't have dough how can I make uh, bread so it's something like that uh, so uh, then yeah test and document this is the part where many like uh, new companies and newbies make the mistake like uh, like um, there are many freelancers who do things like uh, cowboy developers they, they would uh, like jump into okay you want this okay I can write this in 30 minutes they would write something it will work but in the future if you want to make some changes to it then it will be a nightmare for you so it's always a good thing to see like uh, maybe see the resume of the developers you have and see the existing code they have written like in the past so so that you know what what actually they're capable of and the quality of work they they can provide and accordingly you can give them a push in the right direction so that they give you the kind of output you're expecting so uh, document every issue like if something breaks just write it down why it broke and how you solve the problem so in the future if something similar comes up then everybody has the knowledge and uh, even though the employee is long gone you can refer to the issue tracker whichever you use and you can see okay so this happened so this is the solution so uh, then commenting the code like I mentioned uh, so that uh, everybody knows what actually the code is doing so uh, and having good comments actually like you can say like uh, there are developers who write some comments uh, because somebody told them to write comments and then in the future the code changes but they don't update the comments so you see a comment saying add two numbers but actually subtracting two numbers so that doesn't work you have to update the comment and get into the habit uh, and follow some conventions then log your time so that that way you can build a nice like uh, data for future estimations that you will be doing so for example you are doing uh, a newsletter form since I've been talking about it so uh, uh, how much time did it take so in the future you would know last time it took around eight hours or something uh, so this time it will take maybe one hour less or if they have some different requirements then maybe one hour more so you you have a like knowledge base uh, which states like uh, what what the actual time was and this time it will take less or more you can you have the records and the historical data to do it um, and uh, build review demo and repeat so uh, this is a nice like way to put it uh, ju don't just develop and then directly demo it to the client or go live that, that would be a bad thing to do so build uh, your the feature that you're working on then have somebody do some testing in QA and then even a code review if possible uh, so that you know exactly the quality of output you're giving and then have regular demos with the client show them exactly what you built and they would maybe make some suggestions or alterations and then repeat the same process so uh, that way you will always have a nice like stable site and uh, product the, the output would be of a better quality and do as much QA as possible so uh, you need to ensure the quality of output so you need to go for a nice strong like quality assurance thing so uh, uh, actually the word QA reminds me of a friend of mine a colleague uh, that my colleague was a developer and his wife was QA so uh, they made uh, an awesome team so that was really nice and uh, so you're ready for the launch uh, you you just plan ahead like I mentioned many times you need to look ahead and uh, 
be prepared. So before the launch, you need to make sure you have the right input to be able to like feed the website content entry, who is going to do it, and uh, be like sure that everything is tested. Don't be nervous. And uh, if you did a good job, you won't be nervous. You'll be quite confident. And uh, you need to figure out things like uh, domain and hosting. You need to make sure those are there. Like, uh, and then third-party services, uh, you need to make sure you have the necessary licenses and API credentials if you need any. And uh, you need to make sure like, if you have a, like, a big client, then they might have requirement, legal requirements. What are the open source libraries we are using? So you might, might have to give them a list, and so they'll go and look into the license agreement for each of them and uh, state whether everything is okay or something needs to be done about it. And uh, yeah, then then uh, the launch goes well. Then you also need to come up with a maintenance contract and things beyond the launch. You can't just like deliver something and disappear. So uh, a good thing to do is like tell the client, assure the client that I'll be there. Uh, we have been into, in this business for a while and if we build the thing, then we'll be there to help you out. Um, and uh, that, that makes uh, makes good sense. You need to come to terms like how things would work, like maintenance is not free, or maybe we'll give you bug fixes for seven days or two weeks, and after that, everything will be chargeable, and uh, how the thing is going to work. So that, that's good for the long term. So maybe you can have plans, like uh, we'll put aside 20 hours every month to solve your bugs, and things like that. And of course, you, you need some beer for celebration because the project went uh, well. Uh, at Evolving Web, like when we do deployments, uh, we have a parrot GIF on Slack that we like. We release the parrots, and it's a quite a nice, like a nicely annoying GIF. If you want, you can look at it someday. It's like a colorful parrot moving its neck. And uh, okay, so. Uh, yeah, and this this is the part where I give it the mic back to Etienne. Yeah, not worry, guys. This is uh, this is almost over. So if you want to learn more, you have uh, you have uh, the three presentations. Well, two presentations and a book we inspired uh, this talk from. So the first one is most about the scoping phase. is inspired by Daniel Linet, uh, Liret, sorry. Uh, she had a great talk at uh, at Drupal North, and the two others um, part are more about estimation. So the name I have it right here. It's Andy Kusharski, okay, and uh, and the book from Steve McConnell. So feel free to check those presentations; they are pretty good. So now it's time. If you have any questions, uh, I would like I would like to add one more point to that thing. Like uh, since project management is a branch of like management, you might also want to look into the post D Corp thing that exists, like planning. Uh, uh, I forgot the O, but uh, <laughs> reviewing, budgeting, and directing. So it's a nice like principles of management kind of thing. So that's also helpful. I forgot to mention it on the slide. <laughs> okay, so is anybody having a question? Yeah. One of the last few slides you included talking about software licenses and legal agreements and what have you. And what if they had a problem with some open source library that you put in? Isn't that something that would be more relevant in the beginning of the project? Okay, so I'm just going to repeat your question for the recording. So you're asking us, uh, what if a problem, uh, what if the client is having a problem with one of the licenses we are using, and we discover this at the at the end of the project? That's a very good question. In fact, uh, usually the client needs to know. You need to warn them at first that Drupal is, for example, an open source license, and if they have really specific requirements about it, you need to ask them to check what are all the libraries and all the the legal stuff related to Drupal, and they need to give them quite your requirements. Once again, as a project manager, this is your job to go and make sure you are not in the dark on this side. Because as you say, as you're saying, if you if this comes up at the end of the project and you have to redo an entire part of your website because you're using a JavaScript library uh, which is not uh, in fact open source, you're gonna you're gonna end up in trouble. So this is a very good question. Make sure that everything is well defined, including features and also legal terms. Uh, this, this often comes in the contract review. It depends on the client's contract. If it's not mentioned in the contracts from the client, well, you can say, hey, you never mentioned in the contract that we needed to, uh, to use this kind of licenses. So make sure you're defining everything. 
The best case is to use your contract, but most of the big clients or picky clients are going to, to have their contract signed with their terms. So make sure you're defining everything at the beginning of the project, and if you're having any doubts about it, like Jigar mentioned a couple of times, ask the question. Don't say in the dark, like, okay, I just won't ask the question, this is gonna be okay, uh, this is legal stuff, nobody cares, they care. And it's the same for, don't forget about checking the images licenses, this is very important. Most of the time, designers tend to go on Google image, look for, like, yeah. okay, software or hard drive image. Okay, I have this hard drive, I'm gonna put it there. And then you say, oh, this is, the developer is gonna say, oh, this is the final content, I'm gonna use it for the website. And then the client said, oh, it looks good, let's use it. And three months later, he discovers this is not an open source image. And like the guy who took the pictures, like, why is my um, image on your website? I don't like it, pay, for, pay it. So be sure you're defining every step of the legal stuff. This is kind of complex sometimes. You might want to involve uh, lawyers if it's a big project because you want to, to ensure that you won't have problems along the way. But yeah, sometimes it's a, it's a, a hard part to define. Uh, I'll have one point. Like uh, what we also meant was like, uh, sometimes you use certain libraries which are free during dev. And so you have to make sure that when you go live, you have actually paid for the use of the library and uh, that it's like some fonts and uh, you can use it in dev or for personal reasons, personal projects, but uh, if it's uh, some, if you're making profits from your website, then you need to pay. So that, that was the kind of thing we were focusing on at the end of the project, yeah. And that, that could also uh, circle back to communication between the devs and the project managers, um, and if they're developing something and oh, it uses a new library, like mm -hmm. it, it needs to be aware yeah. that these things. Mm -hmm. could, that we have to like note everything yeah. down at like make a list of all the things, like if you use something which is paid, just put it on this list and then we'll take care of the payments later, like licensing. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, great, we are good with that. Uh, just a last slide to let you know we are having uh, Drupal trainings uh, attended by Susan, you saw a bit earlier. So don't let say to, to check our website uh, and we have a contest uh, at our booth, so don't let to drop your uh, your business card to, to, to enter a chance to win a, a free training. Thank you very much.